Welcome back. As promised, I'm joined now by Simone Bridges. Uh, Simone is a great Dallas Cowboys fan and a great follow on Twitter and um, very, very thankful that she was able to take some time out of her very busy schedule to join me for today's podcast. Simone, how are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you, Sharona? I'm great, thanks. Um, since you, first of all, let me um, give you an opportunity. You've been on this show before, and um, I was, as I was planning the end of the year podcast, because I had to take some time off for a variety of reasons. Simone is one of my favorite people, and I've really enjoyed having her on the podcast. It's been a while, so tell everybody just a little bit, you know, about who you are and where they can, you know, find your work and stuff. Okay, well, um, my name's Simone. I'm from I'm, I'm from Dallas. I'm out here in in cowboy country. <laughs> um, you can follow me on on Simone on Sports. Um, there, you'll see a lot of tweets about um, sports social justice issues. I talk a lot about that kind of stuff and how those two things tie in together. Yeah. Yeah, um, they really do. So, oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. these these that these are issues that, you know, they, they cross over into sports, entertainment, all types of different things. So um I talk about that type of stuff a lot. So be forewarned, you know, if you don't like if you're one of those people that <laughs> you know, you just want to see happy, positive things all the time, then you probably won't don't if like following me on Twitter because I. <laughs> if you're a stick to sports person, don't follow either one of us because we. Right, we both, definitely. Yeah. Uh, one of the one things. Those people that, hey, stick to sports. Stop, stop talking about police <laughs> brutality. Stick to sports. Yeah, you won't like me because I, I yeah. definitely talk about both a lot. And I, and I, and I tie them, like I said, I tie them together because they're not as, you know, separated as people people might think. So. You're very much a. You're very much a great Twitter follow, and I was talking to Rita, the NFL chick, earlier today doing an interview for for this show, and uh, I told her, you, both of you, I admire a lot of things about both of you, but your Twitter games are two of the things that, well, two, because both of you, right, the, the thing that, that both of you are so good at, and um, you definitely keep me entertained. So you're Cowboys. Let's, let's start with some Cowboys talk. Your Dallas yeah. Cowboys, such a disappointing season for them. Um, obviously, Tony Romo being injured has, well, their injuries overall have been, um, yeah. have been killers. But, but the big one was Tony Romo, wasn't it? Definitely. You know, and like you said, it, it started before the season when we lost Orlando Skandrick. Um, and then first game we lost, was it first first game or second game we lost Dez? Well, first game we lost Dez. And we lost him against the Giants, which mm-hmm. you know everybody was was like, dang, you know that's a big that's a big loss for us. And yeah. then you know this one, you think it can't get any worse. You lose your number one, you know, offensive target. You know, you you lose the guy that basically runs the whole machine, Tony, yeah. Tony Romo. So yeah, definitely definitely disappointing. You know, you get it's just one of those things where. Like, what can you do? You know, yeah. people say, you know, people will say things like injuries aren't an excuse, and I don't really understand how people say those things. I feel like if you lose, I mean, I, I understand some, some, a lot of teams have had, a lot of teams have faced a lot of, a lot of, a lot of injuries. So. Mm-hmm. It's all yeah, relative. And, yeah. I it mean, is. It's, it's very relative. It is. Yeah. I would definitely say, and I would say losing Tony Romo also exposed a lot of different things. It really did. The Cowboys have, I think know, the Cowboys. You know, you know, listen, Des is a fantastic talent. Don't I'm not in any shape, form or fashion trying to detract from that. But but Roma was the big one because you see the drop yeah. in, you know. Um you can't replace a Des Bryant, there's there's no question. The guys were going to stay, to, you know, step up and um re- losing Tony Romo and having to go to your Brandon Whedon's and you know, the uh, Matt right. Castle. That was just tough, and and neither one of those guys yeah. played particularly well. And so it's you know, um, but you know the division with the division that you're in, it, you know it's oh, no. it's, it's uh, so bad. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it's so bad. It's it's, yeah. it's kind of embarrassing. Like I'm just like I'm just 
like, <laughs> embarrassing the fact that the Cowboys, when when Romo came out, a, a game behind, literally seven seven games in a row, dropped seven games in a row. <laughs> you know, just couldn't win a game at all, and come back, and we're still one game behind. Like, yeah. <laughs> and that's that. That's on. That's just a testament about the division that we're in this year. It's not it's it's not a strong division. It'll probably it's take not. seven games to win it. It's, it'll probably take seven games to win it. And last last year the Cowboys had to win twelve games to win it. And I think we were only one one or two games ahead of ahead of the second place team. So we needed all twelve of those wins to win the division. So it's definitely a down year. So it'll be left in yeah. the NFC. It'll be overall for football. You know, yeah, I feel like the NFL. It's been. It's not been a good year. It's not been a good year. You know, besides your, um, your Panthers, who are obviously undefeated. Patriots. They've, they're a. Uh, they've won eleven games. It's been a down year in the NFL. I know at one point, only eleven teams were over five hundred. I think oh, that wow. was like week twelve. Mm-hmm. Only eleven teams in the whole league were over five hundred. So that that kind of is just a testament of of the football that we've been watching this year. so Yeah, it really has, though, Ben. You, you, you mentioned earlier that inj- the you know about the injuries are no excuse. But as I mentioned, I was talking to Rita, and um, the Ravens have the most injuries, in the, and they have 20 players on injured reserve. And, and when you, and of course, again, it's all relative, but you can't lose 20 players off a 53-man roster and not, <laughs> and you know. to compete yeah. and win, yeah. You just can't, you know, and no one's saying, I, mean, I just don't, you just can't. You can't do it. There's nothing you can do when you yeah. when you literally are playing third-string players against, you know, another team's top players. They're yeah. third-string for a reason. There's yeah. a reason why they're behind, they're behind so-and-so, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. That's what the Cowboys have had to deal with, you know, losing Lance Dunbar against the Saints. He he had been playing pretty well, and then he tore his ACL. Yeah. Um, I think I think Sean Lee had to sit out a game. He had got a concussion. Yeah. Again, it's just it's and then the Ravens, yeah, and then they they had so many injuries, and then they lost their quarterback. Yeah, it's been a tough year for them for sure. And yeah. again, what can you do? You know. It's definitely yeah. relative. It definitely plays a part in how you go out it's, there and compete when you don't have your top guys yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely next man up, and you just have to deal with it and do the best you can. Right. There's, I mean, there's not – I mean, you're not, you're not going to forfeit, right? The, the games are still right. going to be played, and so, um, yeah, you know, I guess right. the Ravens are kind of forced with pulling guys off the street, you know, because – Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's one of those things where, you know, obviously, you know, a win is a win. You know, you have to play who's in front of you. So, mm-hmm. if, yeah, exactly. If the, team, if, the team, if the team that's in front of you just happens to be down 20 players, you know, you're not going to say, oh, well, we didn't really, that's not really a great <laughs> win because their yeah. whole team was injured. No, it's still a great win, and I understand that, that side of it too. But, yeah. you know, when you're, when you're down 20 people, like, I mean, it's just one of those things. What can you do? <laughs> what can you do? For sure. It's yeah, a part of the game. Tony Romo is 35 years old, and in the last couple of years, he hasn't completed a season. He hasn't um, played an entire season. The the status of his back, and he's had various other injuries too. Uh, well known. What what do you think Tony Romo's future is? You know, I definitely think um, it's time for the Cowboys to start looking ahead. It's important because we can't afford, you know, we can't afford it. You really can't. Like, yeah. we're, we're depending, where our season basically depends on if he can or cannot stay healthy, you know. Mm-hmm. He's obviously mm-hmm. injured the same collarbone that he injured the first time. And so that's two injuries in the exact same area in one season. And again, it's very unfortunate. You know, Tony Romo's a great quarterback. I still think he has he a few years left in him. I think he has a few years left in him, but you have to bring somebody in here who's the actual yeah. who's who can actually back him up, you know, who can actually mm-hmm. step in. You know, I feel like, you know, Whedon and Cass they're just they were just kind of fill ins, you know. You needed a backup mm-hmm. quarterback, but you know, neither nobody neither one of them 
could win a game. No one felt like they could actually win a game. And so, you know, even though I guess Castle just won against the Redskins, that was a good win. But, you know what I mean? Like, you have to bring somebody in here who is going to be your future starting quarterback, not just, oh, he's just – He's here just in case something happens. No, you yeah. gotta you gotta start looking ahead and bring someone in here who you believe, when Tony Romo's career is over, will step in and t- as a story starting quarterback and win win you some football games and yeah. lead your team to victory. And so I think that's what Jerry Jones really has to really has to focus on in the upcoming um, draft and the upcoming year. We need we need someone that can come out here and definitely. You know, back he can back Tony Romo up, but you know, mm-hmm. if, if the time ever came, if, and he would be ready to step in and win football games for Dallas. Yeah, it's time to start grooming his successor, and um, you never know, right? I mean, hopefully Tony Romo can come back and and, and all of that. But you know, even so, um, the draft, this upcoming draft, is going to be. Pretty important to the Cowboys. We'll get to that in a minute. I want to ask you first, though, before we talk about your off-season wish list, the running back situation. You mentioned Lance Dunbar, uh, Joseph Randall. They released him, moved on. He's suspended. Um, Christian Michael, that experiment didn't work. He's now back in Seattle after all that. Yeah. Darren McFadden, the leading rusher for the Cowboys. Obviously, they're going to have to – turn their attention to that position, too. Right. Um, definitely, you know, a lot of people didn't want to admit it, but DeMarco Murray, you know, he he did really well for us last year. Mm-hmm. He did really well for us last year, and I think it was definitely a combination of both. I think we made him better. He made us better, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, he's, like because, the third, he's like the third or fourth string now in Philly. Which yeah, yeah. 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 Which is which is really ironic because he was the mm-hmm. lead rusher last year by about 800 yards. Like I think the person mm-hmm. behind him was had like 800 fewer yards than him. He like yeah. he blew. He won. He won. He won offensive player of the year. He blew yeah. out. He blew everybody out in the NFL, and I think that had a lot yeah. to do with our line. And he's yeah. in, he's in Philadelphia. He's in Philadelphia struggling. He's yeah. the last option for running back now. And at the same time, you know, we're struggling with our running back. You know, yeah. we he he was he was very beneficial for us. So it's unfortunate that, that that that's the situation. But they didn't want to pay him, and he wanted more money, and he he went and got it. And now he's not very happy in in Philadelphia, and they're not very happy with him either. So it's it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Um, we definitely we definitely you know went down in that spot, absolutely, no doubt. Yeah. Um, a lot of people thought that our O-line was just so good, it didn't matter who was back there. You know, or they mm-hmm. thought our, our 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 offensive line was just so so strong that they could put any old running back back there and he would be able to get mm-hmm. the same yards that DeMarco Murray got, and that just has not been the case this year. So they're definitely yeah. going to have to have to look for, at a strong, at somebody that's really strong in that position. And I don't know if you look for that in the draft. I don't know if you want to draft a running back coming out of college, or if you want to, or if you want to look for somebody in free agency. Personally, I personally I would rather I would rather them draft a quarterback, mm-hmm. and then I would rather them look for an experienced NFL running back in mm-hmm. free in the free agency. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to really take a look and see who's going to be available in free agency and all that. Of course, we you know kind of know a few of the the college names, and they can certainly you know they're not limited to you know to just drafting you know one position or the other. But you know it, right. it, it is, and you know I think Demarco Murray, um, and that situation reminds me a whole 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 lot of Javon Curse leaving. Uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee Titans, and going to Philadelphia for greener pastures and, and more money. And, um, you know, his career was, was never really the same either. But, you know, um, you can't fault guys really for going after the money. I mean, it, they're, and, and particularly a running back because there's such a short shelf life there. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's exactly what I said when he went to Philadelphia. You know, obviously you never want to see – you know, one of your best offensive players go to a division rival. But, mm-hmm. again, for running backs, the, the shelf life 
for them in the NFL is so short. They they do they are so devalued. You know they mm-hmm. they their value decreases dramatically year by year. So you you have to get paid. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You have to you have to get paid. So oh, you do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, the, and, the, and the ironic part is he he's not even gonna probably he's probably not even gonna finish that deal. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, doesn't. It's just, it, it happens, you know, yeah. and that there, that's something definitely that the, the the Cowboys need to focus on. You know, our defense, our defense wasn't looking too bad. I haven't um, really looked at his contract. I'm, I may pull it up here real quick in a minute. Uh, can, could you see him back in a Cowboys uniform? Did I mean? I don't think no bridges were burned that that I recall. No. I mean, I, I don't think him, I don't think I, 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 could I, I back absolutely there. could. Yeah. I absolutely could see him back in the Cowboys jersey if he got cut. Um, I feel like if he were to be cut by the Eagles, mm-hmm. he would, and then he was a, a free agent. I definitely think that 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 would be an option. I think he would gladly, gladly come back to, yeah. to Dallas. Um, but, you, know, where, that, you know, he's been there. That's just a move that makes a lot of sense. Really, for both sides. Yeah, I, I yeah. absolutely agree with you, and I think, and I think that Demarco, you know, he was here for so long. He he loved he was he he loved the Cowboys. He loved mm-hmm. his teammate. It would not shock me at all. It wouldn't yeah. shock me if he ended up coming back here. And I think the Cowboys would welcome him back. You know, I think they would I, welcome I him so back too. with open arms. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah. I don't think nobody really burnt any bridges. It was a business decision. Everybody, I mean, it's not the 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 Eagles thing with with um, you know Demarco and Lashawn. That seems really yeah. personal. That's, that's a little ugly. Yeah, that's a little, that's a, that's much worse than what was going on in Dallas for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. you could see you know, neither one of those guys wanting to go back there. But yeah. Um, how, so let's talk about the defense. I mentioned Sean Lee. Um, you know, he's a guy he can't stay healthy, but you know he's still leading the Cowboys in tackles. I mean, he's had a great season, but the defense has not been very good this year. What are your suggestions on fixing it? You know, it's interesting because our defense has probably been our our strongest asset this year. That's how bad our offense has been. Yeah. Um, like. For example, I'll give you an example. When we played the Panthers, and I'm going to put this on Romo because he was actually, actually, he actually played again in that game. I think that's okay. the game he got hurt again. Uh, but okay. um, a lot of those pets, they did a, the defense did a great job against Cam Newton. They picked them mm-hmm. off a couple times. They did good. They they did good. They 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 got him a couple three and out. It was our, you know, Romo threw. I think he threw three interceptions, and they all okay. led to touchdowns. I think. I think most of their touchdowns came from our offense, basically. Mm-hmm. And when you have a defense, and but eventually, you know, your defense wears down, and that's again what happened mm-hmm. in that game because when you're when you're continuously uh, getting off the field and coming right back on because your offense is getting three and out and can't get a first down, you know, you're, eventually you're going to wear down, and I think that's what's been happening this season. Even in the games where uh, where the first two games of the season where we won against the Giants and the Eagles. I feel like mm-hmm. the defense, the defense is especially that first game. I remember that first game. We had to come back and win that game actually because we started off so terribly. But the defense is what kept us in the game, you know. So, right. I, I mean, I feel like it. I feel like from last year to this year, it's been almost like a, a 180. You know, and last right. year our defense was a joke. Our defense was so bad. We didn't have Sean Lee, our top defender, and mm-hmm. our offense was just we could put up, we could score every every possession basically. And now I feel like it's, you know, it's flipped basically. It's, it's been the defense can get stops, but the offense can't score, and the offense can't get a first down. And eventually, when you keep having to come back, you know, eventually you're going to get tired. And I think you're going to wear down by week 16, and that, that's what I feel like has happened. So, yeah, it, it is a bit of a, a reversal. You're right, and I hadn't really thought about it that way, but yeah. Um, I think that's a great point, and you know, ideally, you, you know, you're gonna um, you know, get to a critical mass where it's a little bit more even, right? I mean, that's 
kind of the the end game. You rather you know they be. Would, I guess you might sacrifice a little bit of defense for some offense, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's, what That's on kind the of board. crazy. Well, we talked That's about Tony. On yeah, we talked about Tony Romo, and I would be remiss if because I am a Tennessee fan. Jason Witten, the ageless wonder, still getting it done out there. Um, how much longer do you see him, you know, continuing to, to play at the level that he's playing? Jason Witten, man, he's he just – he's a beast, and he's just one of those people – he kind of reminds me of J.J. Watt. You know, he's just, you know, big country, you know, mm-hmm. hardworking mm-hmm. Type, of, type of guy. And, mm-hmm. But, you know, he's, he's definitely going to go down as one of the best tight ends the NFL has ever seen. But Yeah. Again, he's, at, he's in the you know, top three, and he, if not number one. I mean, it's pretty amazing what he's done. It really is. Right, it is. Absolutely. He's had a, and he's had a, I think he just got his 1,000th pass against the Redskins, and um, he's definitely had an awesome, awesome career. And I think he, I think he still has a lot of time, a few years left in him, but, that is you know, that's one, of those, that's one of those things, again, you kind of have to, you got to have a future, you know? Huh. Father time can catch up with you pretty quick too. You just you know, you never you never really know. So what is on your off season wish list? If I if I was a general manager, I would honestly the first thing I'd focus on is a quarterback. I would get an I would I would focus on getting a quarterback, not just a fill in, not just someone because I at this point it's expected that Tony Romo is gonna get injured at some point. That's just kinda how we should expect. So I would definitely draft the quarterback. I'd, I'd get a quarterback, someone who could come in and win games, not just anybody, someone who could come in and win football games for us. Mm-hmm. And next thing, next I would get a running back. Next after that I would want a running back because, again, when you can take pressure off of Tony Romo where he doesn't have to throw every play, sort of like what, sort of like how he did in uh, how he did when we had DeMarco, you know, he could take he could basically take plays off and dish it off to him and we could get a first down, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I agree. It's, it's time, you know. Um, we, you've got to hedge your bets there, and um, wide receiver has to be on that list. You know, there's uh, – the Cowboys are, are just that kind of team that, you know, they could certainly use depth everywhere. And um, so it's going to be interesting. You know, they they've had – a couple of years where their drafts were pretty good, and we'll see how you know they 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 manage this next one. There were there was a lot of talk about Johnny Menzel to the Cowboys. That seems to have died out. Do you do you ever see Johnny Menzel in a Cowboys uniform? You know, it would it our our owner is Jerry Jones, so <laughs> I cannot say that it would shock me. <laughs> Right? I mean, I would not say that it would not shock me. I just, yeah. you know, you just can't ever cancel anything out with Jerry Jones. You, you really can't. Anything can happen. So, I'm, so not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say no. I'm gonna say, yeah. I'm gonna say, you know, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. possibly, you know, and yeah. who knows? You know, who knows what could happen? I know he hasn't oh. had. I know he's had a, a lot of trouble in. Um, Cleveland out there with the Browns, but honestly, yeah. like who, who doesn't have trouble with, with the Browns? You know, yeah, and it's weird. You know, I mean, the the latest things. Uh, Johnny Menzel is suffering from um, the weight of of his so called sins, I, I suppose, because they're not really that bad in the larger scheme of things. He's really not doing. He's not out here, you know, beating women up or, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, um, I think the concerning thing for a lot of people is that he did go to rehab and it does look like, you know, he is still drinking and partying. And so you just, you you know, you wonder, you know, what, did he learn anything? Is it, um, you know, what's going on with him? I think that's maybe the larger, you know, concern. But yeah, the Browns are a mess. It really is kind of crazy how much of a mess they are, and how they never can seem to 
to get out from underneath that cloud. It's like, who's the character on Charlie Brown that, you know, has that cloud constantly around him? You know, it really is It's kind of like that. So um, I want to ask you about Serena and, and her being selected as the Sports Illustrated Spokesperson of the Year. And then I hope we've got some time here at the end. We'll... Uh, I want to circle back around. The last time you were on here, we talked about Black Lives Matter, and I want to circle back to that. But how, Serena is so deserving of the award. How important do you think it is for you know for women of color for her to, her to finally get the accolades that she deserves? You know, I think it's I think it's huge, and um, like you said, for women of color, it's so it's it's really exciting to see someone. Um, like Serena, she's not she's not the the conventional idea of beauty. Mm-hmm. Or like she said, you know, she's mm-hmm. been talked about. She's a she's a darker complexion, mm-hmm. um, and so I know a lot of I know darker complexion black women. You know, black women have had struggles on their own, but I know a lot of a lot of uh, darker complexion women have had you know different types of struggles. And I oh. and I'm not even darker complexion, and I know that. So yeah, to see her, cause, you know, she's been called terrible name she's been mm-hmm. called a man because the her body type to see mm-hmm. her to see her finally getting some recognition is awesome and mm-hmm. um you know what makes me what makes it so so exciting to me is that you know serena is not you know she didn't come from everything that she is she, she, she worked for yeah she didn't come from a lot of money um you know her her family grew up in in compton which i don't know if you know about compton is i do really, Gang, mm-hmm. okay, it's extremely gang ridden, mm-hmm. um, a lot of violence, and you know they're from it's majority African American, and she basically is dominated. She no, not basically. She's completely dominated mm-hmm. a sport that was created for you know white people basically. Yeah. Not only white people, but yeah. affluent white people. Yeah. Not only even not even poor white people, but rich mm-hmm. white people. Yeah. Like people that can afford to go and to go and get a membership to a country club and they yeah. can afford luxuries like, oh, tennis lessons, things like private, that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what, what I was getting ready to say. Those private lessons are expensive. Yeah. That's who tennis was mm-hmm. created for. Tennis mm-hmm. wasn't created for the you know the little dark skinned black girls in the hood. That's not mm-hmm. where, that's not where the idea. And so for her to be now dominating a sport, it's it's an awesome thing. And again, it's just she's an inspiration to a lot of girls that yeah. look like her. You know, she really is. She's an inspiration mm-hmm. to me, and I'm a grown woman, so I, she's inspiring a lot of little girls mm-hmm. who might not think they're so pretty or they're so good yeah. um, to go out and do it and to and to give it their all. Mm-hmm. that it, it is possible, you know. Everyone's mm-hmm. not going to be the next Serena Williams, but, you know, who knows? Whatever they whatever it is they want to be, you know, it's out there for them to go get it. It might be mm-hmm. some, some tough roads, but <laughs> it can be done. And that's, that's kind of what she's shown. And mm-hmm. so, and again, it's, when, you, when you come from a privileged background, it's kind of hard to talk to people and say, oh, come on, you can do it. I did it. You know what I mean? Like, people don't mm-hmm. take you as seriously because it's like, okay, well, you had this and that growing up, you know? But when you come, but she can actually get real with people and tell them, you know, this is what I did. Because, again, she didn't come from a privileged background. She came from very humble beginnings, and every, people are going to take what she says to heart because of that. Yeah, so. yeah there's, you said two things that I want want to address. And first of all, I want to say, um, you absolutely you can't talk about Serena with, without also talking about Venus and, um, you know, how – dominant both of them were, you know, in the sport. And I think the thing that um, that has always touched me, uh, obviously, you know, you admire Serena for, for everything she's done. And I've said I've had a, I had a podcast earlier on in, in, in the year. It's been a long – it's been a pretty good while where we were talking about the greatest athletes of our generation. And I'm not so sure it's not Serena, you know. I, I mean, I'm not so sure that it's not. But um, you know, you, it's it, it's definitely inspiring. But the thing that I, I I think that I connect with in terms of of Serena is how close she is with her sister. Because you know, I'm very close to my sister, and to see the two of them, it, I mean, it just it's amazing to me, and I, and I love it. Right, and it is, and again, I have sisters, so I'm, I come from a family of girls. 
and I definitely understand their love for each other. Even when when Serena and Venus play in a match together, like, you know, obviously Serena is the better sister. She she tends to win those matches more than not. Mm-hmm. And it it seems like it's almost so painful for her. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, like, even, like, she's excited that she won, but at the same time, like, you know, it's almost like she's hurt, like, that she had to be her sister. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. I do. It's like, when you have that love for somebody, when you have that love for for your sister, who is basically your best friend, they've been yeah. doing everything together. They have other siblings. They lost a sister. One of their sisters was murdered almost, I think, in 2003. So I feel like that's probably made them even closer. Probably. Mm-hmm. And so they always just have had each other's back and been in each other's corner, even at the uh, even at the award ceremony. You know, Serena. I mean, Venus was right there on the carpet, right next to Serena, mm-hmm. there to support her, getting her award. So uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely an awesome dynamic to see. And I definitely think that Venus doesn't get enough credit that she, the credit that she deserves because she helped she helped make Serena who she is as a player, yeah. as a person. She helped. Mm-hmm. She made her sister better. She mm-hmm. did. She used to make her sister better. All those times she she used to beat her, and Serena would go back and she would. Mm-hmm. Work hard and train hard. She always says, and she always says that too. She always credits her sister for the success she's had on the tennis court because mm-hmm. she really feels like if it wouldn't have been for her, she would not be the player that she is, the dominant player she is today. So it, it, it's 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 just good for little black girls, Sharona. It really is. Yeah. It's good for little black girls who don't feel they're good enough, pretty enough, mm-hmm. whatever. Who can see. This strong, she's strong, she's dark skin. See her out here mm-hmm. being successful. It's a great, it's great. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you, like, we didn't put this on the production outline. I want to ask you about Gilbert Arenas here in a minute. But the second thing that you mentioned that I want, just real briefly, want to touch upon, and I hope that you'll come back and we can discuss this in more detail because I do think it's important. I never, and I see it on Twitter, the, you know, the, um, the, you know, I, I'm I'm white, and I, there's no way I could understand that. I, I never have understood the whole debate between light skin and dark skin. I mean, you find beauty everywhere, and and I, that's that's just that that um, whole debate thing. I, it was something that I never got. Right. Um. Well, Sean, I can tell you this. This is not. That's nothing new. Um. Light skin being favored is nothing new. This is literally something that dates back to way before any of us were even here. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know how versed you are on history and slavery and things like that. But, you know, there was a time when, you know, there were certain certain slaves with one complexion were treated um, better than others. There were Mm -hmm. these slaves were able to. These slaves were able to live in the house, you know, mm-hmm. they lived in better conditions, they 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 were under they were up under master and yeah. you know, they were they were basically a part of the family, you know. Right. They had less, their 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 duties weren't as intense as, you know, people out there picking cotton in fields in the hot sun and stuff. And those were darker ass I mean darker people. Mm-hmm. So it really dates that um again, people Slaves, they were just, if you were lighter complexion, and a lot of that had to do with, you know, a lot of these slave masters were sleeping with their slaves, creating, Mm -hmm. you know, creating mixed children and Mm light-skinned children, and that's a lot, you know. So, again, that's, it's it's, it's deeper than that. There's a really deep meaning to it, but that's just kind of like the surface stuff. You know, it's it's always been this way. It started back in the 1800s, probably before then, but... It was really, it was really, it really, 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 really started then when, you know, you had your um, indoor slaves, you had your outdoor slaves, and that's kind of when people started noticing the separation. And it's still an issue today, as sad as that is. It still is an issue today. I think that's the thing that is so um, surprising to me. I mean, I'm probably not nearly as well versed it as you are, but you know, I obviously have some familiarity, and um, I guess I just don't understand the perpetuation of that. If that makes any sense, you know why? 
why there wouldn't be more of an effort to eradicate those prejudices that were way beyond your control ever, you know, kind of to begin with. And and I know right. that there, there's, it's complicated. I understand that, right? And there he is. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it's not just, it's not just, um, it, what people, a lot of people don't understand is it's really not just a black people issue. It's really mm-hmm. not. There are, there are, in, in the Latino and Spanish community, you know, darker people from Spain tend to look down on, say, like a Mexican because Mexicans tend to be a little darker. Mm-hmm. And so it's really, it's an issue in multiple communities. In India, you know, they have lighter Indians and they have darker Indians, and, and a lot of times the darker ones are the poor ones. They're the ones that live on the streets, and the lighter ones are affluent. You know, it's a really mm-hmm. anti, it's anti-blackness, basically, anti-dark, darkness. Mm-hmm. It's a really huge problem. I don't know if you um, were hearing about what was going on in in um, the Dominican Republic. You know, they wanted to deport Haitian people that were born in the Dominican Republic that are Haitian. You know, Haitians have darker skin, but they're, yeah. they're technically Dominican because they were born mm-hmm. there. You right. know what I mean? But their their ethnicity mm-hmm. is just Haitian. Their family came, their families came over from Haiti, but they were born in Dominican Republic, and they a lot of they want them they want them deported back to Haiti, and a lot of that mm-hmm. has to do with anti-blackness because a lot of these people mm-hmm. these are these are black Dominicans, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, again, it's it's a it's a large it's a really big issue, and it it still goes on today in all different types of cultures, and it's really unfortunate. It really is, you know. I I, I never I'm fortunate enough. Um, I have a um, I have a my my father is black. He's black black like <laughs> mm-hmm. very dark skin. And my mom is. It's we actually joke because um, I I know you know about Rachel Dozel, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So she's actually darker than my mom. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, my does mom. Your, yeah. I'm, does your mom identify as black? Yes. Yes. Okay. She's, she's okay. black for sure. Okay. She's black. She's 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 Cajun, but but she's black. You know, right, right. Mm-hmm. Which is, it's, she's still black. She's she definitely has a black a black mother and father. Okay. And, but she, she just has looks, lighter skin. She looks, she, okay. Right. She's very, very very light skin. So, um, I feel like it was never an issue that we grew up with. My mom never pushed that on us. Mm-hmm. It was just never something that I that that I felt like I would. You know, I I feel like I probably had a lot to do with with my mom too. She never made us feel like. You know, we were too right. dark or anything like that. She never made it seem like she was better than us. It was just nothing like that. You know, this was just, it was mm-hmm. never an issue. I didn't even really learn about this stuff until I got older. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Started seeing and hearing things for myself, started branching out. And that's when, you know, when those that shelter wasn't around me to understand right. what how the world works. That's when I started learning, you know, about these types of things. So, yeah, it's it's a deep issue in it it is sad that it's still going on. It really is, and you know it's especially with something like color. Like you just can't control that. So you can't. You, can't. you really can't. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce her her last name, but uh, Lupita, who is so beautiful and she's very dark skinned, and um, yes. she's a she's stunning. You know, stunning. She's stunning, but she's also getting a lot of attention. And, and endorsements. Do you think that that's going to help possibly, you know, maybe eradicate that? I, I mean, I definitely think so. I think that's offset because, honestly, like, rate, I'm sorry, representation matters, you know. Mm-hmm. People, to people, seeing people that look like them on the on magazine covers and on, it matters. It matters to to black girls that don't think they're pretty enough because, Every time they open up a magazine, all they see is, you know, white, blonde hair, blue eyes, or, you know, very light-skinned black women with really long or curly mm-hmm. hair. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, to see someone to see someone like Lupita who, you know, she has a bald fade or she has really, really short hair, very, very dark skin complexion, to see someone like that on the front of a magazine, it boosts the self-esteem of, when, of little girls that look like her. Because, again, representation matters. That's why I'm such a huge fan of them, of you know, Barbie has been coming out with all these black Barbie dolls with Afro hair, and they just came out with a um, Ava Barbie doll with more the long braids. Like that makes me so happy because when we were growing up, we didn't really have that. You know what I mean? Right. We right. played, you know, 
there, I mean, there might have been one on the shelf, but it wasn't a very large variety. It was just we played with it. We played with that one black Barbie, and then we had like a most mostly white Barbies and white babies. So to know that little girls will have, will see will see Barbies and say, oh, that that girl looks like me, and she's a Barbie, and that's gonna help their self esteem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I people don't think, people don't think it's that big of a deal, but people yeah. really don't understand representation matters. It absolutely it really does matters. matter. Yes. Yeah, no, I com- I completely agree. I, I want to ask you just real quick before I let you get out of here that uh, the last time you were here, we talked a little bit about about this. I don't, it might not have been the last time, but then one of the, the last few times you were on here, Ben Truth was on as well. We talked a little bit about infighting in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and something interesting happened this week. I wanted to ask you about it and get your thoughts, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. It looks like... And I don't know if this qualifies. It, 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 on the surface, it looked like it was to me. Um, people are questioning Sean King and what he's d- done with the money for Black Lives Matter. What do you? Can you help me make some sense of all this? You know, it's. I, and I haven't. And I haven't read. 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 I know there was like a a long report. That there came was out a long that, report. Yeah. That just came out, and it basically said. You know, I think it said that he had donated like he had donated he had he had basically he had raised money for Haiti and I think he kept like a hundred sixty thousand dollars of it and I uh, it, I again I didn't read it all but um, I didn't read it either yeah I think a lot of people are concerned and I think their concerns are valid <clears throat> I think their concerns are valid for sure um, I'm not gonna I'm not saying he's a thief. At all, I I don't know mm-hmm. enough. I haven't looked into it enough to be able to say that without a doubt that oh he's definitely stealing money. But it you know uh, it's definitely alarming when you know when you're taking a fifty percent commission when you're raising two hundred fifty thousand dollars and you're taking a hundred sixty thousand of it. You know, it's definitely confusing, and that's why a lot of people, um, you know, are really kind of in and you know it's funny. Sharona, he okay. So I don't know what happened between them because I know he had started a new he had started a new um, organization called Justice Together, and mm-hmm. I actually I actually had signed up for it. You know, I had signed up and I was actually part of the Dallas chapter. Mm-hmm. So he did that, and um, I guess he got a job with New York Daily News, and he decided. Oh, okay. Uh, he decided. He decided. Okay, you know, we're not going to do it. He's not going to do it anymore. And I guess whoever had donated money, he he was. He sent it back, and DeRay, DeRay and Netta, who he was actually arguing with this weekend, they were on there, and they were a part of Justice Together too. And I guess when they started asking questions about how how he was keeping money and donations, um, that's how the fallout began, basically okay, between the I two gotcha. parties. Um, and again, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened because. It just seemed like, you know, Sean took a shot at DeRayanetta over the weekend, and it just seemed like it kind of came out of nowhere. You know, I don't know if you saw the mm-hmm. tweet, but he said, um, he said, oh, I'm not in, I'm not, you know, taking pictures of, I'm not, with, I'm not meeting with presidential candidates taking photo for photo ops, and because you know DeRayanetta had met with Bernie Sanders. Right, and right. Hillary. I remember that. Yeah, that that's yeah. Kind of, so that's kind of what started all the fighting, isn't it? I mean. Well, the big fighting. Um, I, there might have been some little stuff going on, but that's yeah, when, think, yeah, yeah. That's I think from one from because they were they they from my knowledge what from my knowledge what happened is he was upset. Uh, I guess that he didn't like the way that they were asking him about um, money and how he was recording money and keeping money and things of that nature. He didn't like that, and and so he Deray said that after he asked him questions about you know, the money and stuff that Sean King blocked him on Twitter. Because I, I know they were friends. I've seen pictures with them together. And when I when he started the organization in August, he mentioned how DeRay and Netta were going to be a part of it. So I know that they were cool at some. They were definitely friends at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but, see, this weekend, I don't know what happened this weekend that, that started it. I don't know if something happened to make him say that. 
to make him send that tweet um, where he was kind of throwing shade, like, oh, you guys are just meeting with the president. He said something about, I don't, I, I actually do things. I don't meet with presidential, presidential candidates for uh, photo ops. And mm-hmm. I don't know what, I basically, I don't know what, uh, what provoked that, that tweet at all. Um, and obviously, Netta saw it, and she was having none of it. At all. <laughs> she was having none of it, and and you know what? And you know, a lot of people say. Here's my opinion on that. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't like, I don't like infighting. Yeah. I don't like it at all. I don't. But, and can I, can I, can I cuss on here or no? No, the police go ahead. You, you can say whatever you want. I think. I think it's important. I, I don't like. I said I do not like infighting. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not like fighting on fighting in public spaces. Mm-hmm. But Sean King brought it to a public mm-hmm. space. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important. I think it's important to let somebody know when they have you fucked up, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, too, too, many times, too many times. Sometimes you. Sometimes, sometimes you gotta let them know. Yeah. When they have you fucked up, but yeah. I truly believe that, especially, yeah. especially. I have a really see my thing is being a black woman, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not saying that I I'm not saying I, I I go off about little things, but I am big on respect and like I feel like sometimes people try me because they think because I'm nice and because I'm nice, and so when I even sense like I'll shut it down quick because again I feel like people respect that more than mm-hmm. you know. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. I feel when it's the second I'm tried, if the second I'm tried, I'll let you know quickly. Mm-hmm. In a, and I'm not going to cut you out. I'm not going to do all that stuff. But you will know that you have me fucked up. And you will mm-hmm. you will absolutely know. You have someone fucked up. Don't ever do this shit again. Don't ever mm-hmm. do that again. Don't ever talk to her like that again. You'll know. Like, mm-hmm. again, and again, I, I'm not going to get all loud and, you know, cuss, cussing and stuff. But you'll definitely know I'm not the one. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You'll oh, know. yeah. I think that's yeah. important. I think it's it important. Is. A lot of people were saying, a lot of people were saying she should have just ignored it and blah blah blah. And I don't agree with that. And again, see if he if she if he would have said that behind behind closed doors and she would have just come on Twitter popping off, then I would say, okay, I think she's in the wrong for that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that again he brought it to public, he brought it to the public space. So I don't, I'm not mad at her for addressing it in a public space. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm not yeah. mad at her. Or I'm not mad at her for letting him know that she that he had her messed up that that that's not that's that that's not what it was about to happen. She mm-hmm. was not about to let that slide, and I'm not mad about that because I feel yeah. like no, like mm-hmm. I feel like that she got my respect for that because a lot of people would have just let it go on, be the bigger. Everyone's always t- trying to tell you to be the bigger person, and I think being mm-hmm. the bigger person is good sometimes. Yeah, but I think sometimes, mm-hmm. I think sometimes no, you don't need. Sometimes to- you just gotta let them know. Sometimes you just have to let them know, yeah. and I think that, that that was a good time to do so. Yeah. You know, and then and then you notice she got her she got her a few teeth off, and then she said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this anymore. And I think that was good. She didn't go on all day. She didn't keep going and going and going and going. She she told him not to try, not to do it, and then mm-hmm. she backed off. You know, and I think that was I think that was good. So again, you know, it's not it's not the best thing, it's not the best look, but I don't think it's it's not harming the movement. The movement the movement very much still is. Um this is not a this is a leaderless movement. I always say that to people. Yes, mm-hmm. there are prominent prominent people in the in this movement, like obviously Sean King, DeRay, Netta. They're prominent people, but they're not leaders. They're not Martin Luther King. They're you know what I'm saying? They're not yeah. they're not leaders of the right of of the Black Lives Matter movement. They're just prominent activists. Right. Activists that people know. I'm an activist. People mm-hmm. just don't know who I am and I and I prefer it that way. Um but they're just prominent activists and they just had a disagreement, basically. That's kind of how I look at it. Um Yeah, it's nothing new. I know I know I, I probably said this before. Inviting is nothing new. If mm-hmm. Twitter was around during the first oh week, lord, oh lord, entertaining stuff. Can't even like, imagine. X, Malcolm <laughs> X did not like. He did not like. He didn't. He didn't like. Not like Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King yeah. did not like him back. And yeah. they said nasty things about each other in the mm-hmm. press, and they said nasty things about each other's organizations, and it that that's just what happens. And it's mm-hmm. whatever. It's not that big of a deal. People are saying. 
oh my gosh, it looks so bad to uh I'm like, listen, those people didn't care about you before. Like they they were it's not like they were they were on the fence and then oh an argument broke out and all of a sudden they're like, Oh well, I'm not gonna support them now. They were never mm-hmm. gonna support you regardless. They yeah. were never gonna support the argument regardless. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. So like I don't even care. Like I'm not they're like, Oh, CNN and all these other stations are gonna see this and I'm like, So like that doesn't matter. I'm not here to appease to appease and make other folks feel comfortable. That's not the point of this. No, you know it's not. Saying? It really is. It's actually the antithesis of it. Right. Exactly. Like yeah. so them them seeing us fight doesn't make me cringe like it does some people. It just doesn't. Like and again, Ned had every right to let him know that that was not that that was not where this, where it was going. And he cuz I, again, I don't know what happened. Maybe something happened I didn't that I didn't see. But from what you know, me, I I'm very nosy. I, I go and investigate things. I all I didn't see anything between the two, and all I saw was he threw that sh- tweet throwing shade, and then Netta was like, "Oh, I've been waiting." So apparently there had been some drama behind the scenes because she was just like, "I told you not to try me," and blah blah blah. Right. And so apparently there were some issues going on, and yeah. he brought it since he <laughs> brought it to the public to a public space. She decided that that's where she was going to take it. He started it, and she decided to finish it, basically, which is what she did. Right, right. Which is exactly what happened. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal. I don't really know where Sean King stands. I mean, um, again, I feel that that, um, report that came out about him, um, Uh it was not positive. It was not positive. Um, for him, that's for sure. It, was, it, it certainly it, looked like it warranted some investigation. I I, I agree right, with that. Right, absolutely. And I, again, I didn't read it all. I, I still haven't read it all, but yeah. um, just the summary that I was getting from people mm-hmm. that people were like, it was not a good look on his part. Right. So I don't really know where he stands. I know that he he deleted like all his tweets supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. So you know. Oh yeah. You, 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 yeah, yeah. He deleted all. He deleted that like seventy thousand. That seems kind of petty, doesn't it? It does, and it makes you know, for people like me, it makes you wonder. Okay, you know, it it looks like you were using this as for profit, you know. Yeah, yeah, it for does. profit. It looks like you were profiting off of off of black people's pain, and that's that's obviously upsetting. You know, yeah. you definitely you want to believe these people are not doing this for any <laughs> ulterior yeah, but, motives, particularly after they were. Um, so supportive of him, you know, when he was under attack by was it Brit Ball? Right. That, yeah. 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 Who was BS? Who was obviously BS? Yeah. But yeah, and they were very. Duray and Netta were very supportive of him, and they they voiced their support for him um, during that whole fiasco. And uh-huh. so it's definitely it's definitely sad to see. You know, he got he got this writing job with the New York Daily News, and you know now he's again it seems like he's not really a supporter of the movement or he just deleted all his tweets supporting the movement. And you definitely wonder, you know, was this his, his goal the whole time? Did he just have ulterior motives just to, you know, you definitely don't want to be taken advantage of. And it feels, you know, there's some people who are not in this for the right reason. And I can attest mm-hmm. to that. There's people that want, that want to get notoriety or fame mm-hmm. from this. And, you know, when people put trust in you, you never want you never want to find that out, and that's kind of what it's looking like. But again, I don't think it does any harm to the movement. Yeah, I, no, I don't think so either. I, I did not know that he had deleted all those tweets. That is very, 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 very interesting. Great stuff, Simone. I kept you far too long. I'm so sorry, but it's always so fun to talk to you, and I enjoy our time together. And again, I'm so thankful that you. Uh, are willing to to volunteer your time to come on and and talk about all these things. Tell everybody out there where they can find you again. So um, you can follow me on Twitter. My uh, Twitter handle is Simone on Sports. That's Simone with an I. So S I M O N E O N S P O R T S. Simone on Sports. And again, I you know I, I talk a lot about you know social justice, feminism, racism. And a lot about basketball, a lot about football. So a little mixture of everything. So follow me on Twitter. Yeah, definitely. She's a great follow. Um, have, a, have a great, great, great rest of, well, we're recording this um, late on Thursday evening. So have a great what's, what's left, left of the night. And thanks again. Awesome. Okay. Well, happy holidays, Sharona. Hope yeah, you, you too. Happy New Year, all that stuff. Same to you. 
All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.